this morning. We want to thank the praise team and, and, uh, and the band for the wonderful praise and worship that was uh, given unto the Lord this morning uh, and, uh, and uh, dance and mime as they minister to the Lord and dance and mime. We just appreciate them for that and, and uh, what they've done here. Um, I, would, I want to let you know that this week we'll be finishing up Gifts of the Spirit and we're going to be talking about teacher, the office of teacher today. We'll be finishing up Gifts of the Spirit. Now next week we're going to start on um, Who Told You? And that's going to be a very important series. It's only about three weeks, maybe four at the most. Uh, so at, at max, that's all it is. But it's, it is life-changing and it is important because it helps you understand some fundamental things concerning who you are in Christ and where God is uh, taking you. Uh, and and but more, even greater than that is, is, is it's really kind of loud up here. Uh, greater than that is how you are able to see how things come at you. And that becomes, I think, extremely important. So who told you? I think if you can bring somebody, bring people, whatever, but people need to hear this because many of us have misconceived notions about temptation and all that in involves. And if you're not, if you don't know, uh, then you're going to be in condemnation about something that it doesn't even belong to you. It doesn't even belong to you. You know, own the things that belong to you, but the things that don't belong to you, you don't need to own those. All right, you just don't need to own those, and it's a trick of the enemy to get you to own something that doesn't belong to you. All right, let's talk about gifts of the Spirit. So next week, make sure, bring, be here, bring somebody, call somebody, say, hey, you need to come hear this because this is really going to help you out. All right, gifts of the Spirit, we're going to talk about teacher today. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank and praise you and give you glory. We thank you, Lord, for just uh, your word as you explain it to us, as you reveal, Heavenly Father, more and more about yourself, your word, uh, what, what you expect of us, how we're to live in the kingdom, how we're to be uh, upstanding kingdom citizens. And so, Father, we pray in Jesus' name that as we receive these words, Heavenly Father, that we then grow and become strong in our, uh, in our, in our faith, uh, strong by the Spirit, uh, of the Lord, the Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, being able to withstand every fiery dart that the enemy throws at us, putting on the full, full or whole armor of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I got a couple of scriptures for you to start off. The first one is found over in uh, Ephesians 4, uh, and is going to be verse 8 and 11. Verse 8 says, Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and gave gifts to men. So, we, I told you, I think last week, I explained that verse, how Jesus uh, paraded uh, the demons through the heavenlies, uh, showing he captivated them or held, held them in captive, but also those who were in Abraham's bosom or the place of the righteous dead, uh, how he led those who were captive there out of that place and on into heaven. All right, then it says in verse 11, and he gave some as apostles. So these are the gifts he gave to men. Some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. So not all are apostles, but some. Not all are prophets, but some. Not all are evangelists, but some. Not all are pastors and teachers, but some. Uh, then verse 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles and gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. So now Paul begins to give some order to what God has placed in the church. And then in Romans 12, verse, starting at verse 4, he says, For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, in other words, your body, you have a, you know, hands, feet, ears, nose, but every member is different. Every body doesn't have the same function. Every part of your body doesn't have the same function. He says, So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, Remember, those gifts are given to us. Each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. Or he who teaches, in his teaching. Or he who exhorts, in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So here, Paul begins to share that, you know, everybody's not going to have the same gift. Everybody's gift is going to be different. And whatever gift you have... Work the gift according to the faith that you have. Work it uh, and, and begin to, you know, use the gift. And you'll find that that gift will then begin to uh, shine or make itself more pronounced in your life. But here we're going to talk about teacher today. And uh, 
Here, and as I said earlier, the teacher is one of the ministry gifts. What we call it a five-fold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. The teacher is one of the ministry gifts given by Jesus Christ to his church, to us, the body of Christ. And not the Baptists or not the Methodists or not the Episcopalians, but his church. His church doesn't have a denominational title. The only denominational title you might say his church has is, it's the church of Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. And uh, we all fall under that banner. Amen? Uh, now, one of the things about the teaching gift is that it can be connected to any of the other ministry gifts. In other words, uh, the apostles need to be able to teach. The prophets need to be able to teach. The evangelists should be able to have some teaching ability, and definitely the pastors should be able to teach. In fact, one of the things you find when you look at um, uh, 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 Ephesians uh, 11, verse 4, chapter 11, ver chapter 4, rather, verse 11, is it says pastors and teachers. So it, it almost concludes that the pastor slash teacher ministry is, all, is, is really well connected. But also as apostles and prophets, there ought to be some teaching there. You ought to be able to teach. Um, every single person in that ministry gift ought to have that ability. And it's a divine ability, not something, well, I, I guess I'll teach a little bit. No, it's a divine ability you should have to be able to teach. Now the Bible says over in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and to show you where there were teachers in the Bible, it says, Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So there were five people here who were, that, that are named at least, there might have been a few more, but there were five at least that were named who were gathered together, ministering to the Lord and fasting. So they had made a, uh, 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 they had decided they're going to minister to the Lord and, and, and fasting and prayer. And it mentions these five, and it calls them prophets and teachers. All right? And it says, the Holy Spirit then said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So in the midst of that praying and fasting, then the Spirit of the Lord spoke. But he was speaking to prophets and teachers. So it goes to identify the fact that there were prophets and teachers in this, in this prayer meeting. Now, how long they were together, how many days, it doesn't say, but it says when they had got done ministering to the Lord, then Barnabas and Saul then when began to make, uh, make a, a preparation for the missionary journey that God had already called them to do. So here was just an affirmation or a confirmation of what God had already spoke to Barnabas and Saul about going into all the world preaching the gospel. Now, specifically, he called them to do a certain task, and we see as we go through the book of... Um, book of Acts, we see that their missionary, where their missionary journey took them and the cities they went to, and they, as they went there, establishing churches. As, and, and so from this point, they went from prophet and teacher to apostle. And, uh, and then we understand that Paul, and then, in fact, as he addresses those churches, he establishes, he calls himself the apostle Paul. When he goes to Jerusalem, where the main church is, they acknowledge him as the apostle Paul. But at this juncture, when they first started, he was probably a prophet and teacher. Amen? So you have these five different men that are listed and, 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 and they're ministering and praising, you know, ministering to the Lord and fasting and prayer. You know, and that's one of the things that we probably need to do a little bit more is minister to the Lord and fasting and prayer, taking the opportunity to pray uh, more so that we can see where, what God is saying to us, number one, uh, and also, uh, you know, who he is elevating, when I say elevating, not above everybody else, but well, who he's calling out to do a certain task at a certain time, and, and so forth and so on. And we find that done in prayer, as we pray and fast, and then God speaks to the prophets, he speaks to any one of the, in the fivefold ministry. Normally, it's going to be the apostle and the prophet, and sometimes the pastor, amen. All right, so I'm just kind of throwing out a bunch of stuff here to you. I'll, I'll get to a little preaching here in a minute. Uh, now, all, I, I believe that all pastors ought to be teachers. I think every pastor who oversees a flock ought to be teachers. They need to do more than just uh, um, holler. They need to be able to give, you need, need to be able to teach people. In other words, give the revelation of God to people. Uh, but not all teachers are necessarily pastors. It is a separate ministry gift but I believe all pastors, I believe all prophets ought to also be teachers. I believe all apostles 
ought to be teachers. Now, I don't think every evangelist needs to be a teacher because an evangelist, as he goes about what he's doing, and we talked about this in the, in the evangelistic ministry gift, as the evangelist goes about what he's doing, he's going about, and he's going to out into the world, literally, to where lost souls are, and he's ministering a very simple gospel of Jesus. I don't want to call it simple, but you understand my, my point. The, the, the basic gospel of Jesus Christ for, to, to bring sinners to salvation. Uh, then they need to be set in a church where a pastor can then begin to teach them. Uh, so uh, every pastor ought to be a teacher, but every teacher is not necessarily going to be a pastor. Amen? Uh, the difference is the pastor has oversight over a flock, so he has to have more gifts in operation than the teacher necessarily. He has to be able to, uh, uh, be able to have oversight of that flock, be able to see what's happening with the flock, understand what's going on. He has to have some insight. Some of the words of knowledge and word of wisdom are going to operate sometimes in his ministry to help him understand what's going on with somebody, to be able to see, uh, uh, see beyond what they're telling him or her. Amen. Uh, and so many, because, you know, y'all know what's happening. Y'all know the fact that a lot of times y'all say one thing, but you're not always telling the whole truth. Not that you're lying, but you're just omitting some things. Amen. And so somebody, sometimes you need somebody to, you know, God, God needs somebody in a, in a pastoral role to be able to say, hey, no, no, you, that's only part of it. What's the rest of it? Because God is showing me that there's more to what you're saying than what you're saying. And so you need, to, you need to have that. And a pastor who oversees a flock has to know that. It's like the, the shepherd over the sheep. He, he instinctively knows. If he knows the sheep, he instinctively knows when one of the sheep has gone astray. Wait a minute. Somebody's missing. Let me see. There's Joe and Jed and, and Marvel and Melvin and, and Mary. and oh, oh, Somebody's missing. And he instinctively knows somebody's missing. And he goes out and wrangles that sheep and brings them back to the herd. You know, uh, in the modern church today, we don't necessarily, we don't do that too much. We don't, we don't like to, we like to stay out of people's business uh, because we think, well, that's their business. If they get it, they get it. If they don't, they don't. And, 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 you know, you are responsible for you. I want to make sure you understand that. You are responsible for you. You're responsible for what you do, how you act, the things you do in life. You are responsible for you. You have to answer to God for you. But also as a pastor, I have to answer to God about you. And I have to be able to say, yes, Lord, I showed them, I told them, I, as you showed me or, or revealed to me, I revealed to them. So, you know, so then the responsibility, if you don't follow through, falls back on you. So there is a responsibility you have. There is a responsibility you have to follow through, not only what the Word of God has to say, but also what the pastor is, is, is feeding you and telling you and delivering to you. So that's why you got to listen to the messages. You got to receive it. You got to get it down in your spirit. Then you got to begin to do it, do it. Because the Bible says you can't be just a hearer of the Word. You also got to be a doer of the Word. God, you know, a lot of folk know a lot of stuff, but a whole lot of folk aren't doing a lot of things. A lot of folks say, oh, you know, think about this. How many, how many messages on Sunday morning all over the world, how many sermons are preached every single Sunday around the world? Wow, hundreds of thousands. Probably more than that, millions probably. I mean, I don't know how many churches there are in the world. That's, that's how many messages are. And, and, and just about, most of them are going to be different. Some very similar, but everybody's got a message from God for their congregation, their flock that they're giving. And those words are going out there. I mean, millions all over the world are being ministered to. Me, definitely billions, uh, several, uh, over a billion and a half, two billion people are being ministered to. Million churches, I don't know how many churches there are in the world, but however many, you know, those messages are going across every Sunday at the 9, 10, 11 o'clock hour in whatever time zone you're in. That message is going out. It's a word from God. So God is not short in giving his word. God is not keeping a word from his people. The word is going forth. But how many people sitting in the pew are receiving that word and then living that word on a regular basis? See, so you, you know, I have the responsibility to bring, to deliver the package. You have the responsibility to open it and use the package. Amen. You have that responsibility to make sure that, hey, I've heard this. I hear what God is saying, and I'm going to begin to do that. It may go against your tradition. It may go against what you, what you thought, know, what you thought you knew all your life. Doesn't matter what you thought you knew all your life. It's a matter of what is God saying? What is God's word said? You know, uh, in, in line with teacher, 
one of the things that we look at a lot of times is, uh, especially in the church, we've, we've looked at the Sunday school teacher as operating that gift. Well, not so. so just because somebody's a Sunday school teacher doesn't mean they operate in the office of teacher. Because think about this. I don't know if you realize this or not, but Sunday school has only been around probably about 150 years, if that long. They didn't have, they didn't have Sunday school in the early church. They didn't have Sunday school for, uh, for almost 2,000 years. That's a tradition we have. We have and so mo most churches say, oh, man, we can't do it without Sunday school. Well, you know, we, so we get caught up in a traditional thing of we got to have Sunday school rather than we've got to make sure that the people are growing by whatever means necessary that we can use, that they're, they're receiving the revelation of God and then not only hearing it, but then doing what the Word of God is telling them to do. So, they're, they're, and, 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 so, you know, it's, it's not the Sunday school teacher that operates in that gift. That's something that normally what we've done is we have Sunday school for our youth. Sometimes you have an adult Sunday school class or you have an adult Sunday school class and you have somebody who has a manual and they're teaching out of that manual and uh, it's, a, it's the quarterly and they're doing, you know, they're doing what that thing says and so forth and so on. And that's nice. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying anything against it. I'm just simply saying that's not the office of teacher. That's not the office of teacher. Maybe, you, maybe you're a school teacher. That doesn't mean you're in the office of teacher. Maybe you have an, a natural inclination to teach. Maybe, you, you know, maybe you're, you're pretty good at conveying information to people in a way that they can understand it. Maybe you're pretty good at uh, uh, being able to make complicated issues very simple and, 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 and easy to understand. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're in the office of the teacher. I'm telling you this, the office of teacher is an anointed office. It is something that is given by God through the Holy Ghost to the individual. You, you could have never been a, a taught a thing in your life, but when you step into that office, all of a sudden things open up. But not just being able to convey information, but things open up like the revelation of God opens up to you. You know, I, I used to think, man, you know, uh, 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 you know, you know wh why is some, some guys seem like they can just do some things just so easy? And, you know, you say, well, they're, they, you know, we, use, we throw out the term, well, they're gifted. We say, ah, ah they're, they're gifted. They have a, they're, they're gifted. They're, they're, it's, it's easy for them because they're gifted. But do we really understand what it means to be gifted? Do we really understand what it means that when you are, when you are, uh, uh, you step into one of the ministerial offices, do you really understand that that changes your life? It changes your perception. It changes how you see the world. It changes your communication with God. It changes all those things. Before I was just, I was a Christian. I remember what been before I was ever a pastor or anything else. And, and, and I would just, you know, I, I hear with my pastor and I listen. And, and it was good stuff, man, I'm telling you. But there was a lot of things still I didn't quite understand. I mean, I, I consider myself a pretty smart guy and, and the natural. I have a good IQ and all that business. But still, there were, you know, there were concepts, spiritual concepts. Because no matter how, what you have here in your brain, no matter what you, you think your IQ may be, there are spiritual concepts you're not going to get except by the Spirit. Except by the Spirit. doesn't matter how smart you are naturally. But there are things you will not get except by the Spirit. And you could take somebody who we, we look at and say, well, that not too, they're not too smart. But by the Spirit, they'll understand complex spiritual concepts and be able to operate those in their life. And we say, man, how, 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 how did he know that? How do you know? Well, it's because it's the Spirit that reveals. And, and so, you know, when, you, when you're operating in the ministry gift of a teacher, you know, God opens you up. He, he opens you up and kind of drops something in you. And what he drops in you changes your life. As with any of the ministry gifts, it changes your life. You begin to see things differently. You see the world differently. I, I'm, I'm always amazed. Always. I, I'm, I just, and I have to stop and remember I have to really stop and remember, I see the world different than everybody else. Not like everybody, I'm the only one, but I'm saying, you know, the most people, in the, the people in the world. I see the world differently. Because I'm constantly amazed at when I read, whether I hear the news, read the news, or see what's going on in the world, I'm constantly amazed that this is crazy. Now, we can all sit here and agree that the world has gone crazy. Amen? The world, I, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm not joking. The world has gone crazy. It, they, they are loony as loony can be. But when you don't have a spiritual insight, 
When you're not filled with the Holy Spirit of God and you don't have a spiritual insight, then what they do is logical to them. It makes perfect sense to them. Until you are spiritually woke up, until you are born again, and I'm not just talking about, okay, I got saved. There had, I mean, because I know a lot of folk who are quote-unquote saved and they're kind of loony. Okay, kind of loony. But when you take the opportunity to study the Word of God, what does the Bible say? The Bible says this, study to show thyself approved to who? To who? Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman who needs not be ashamed. In other words, he's not ashamed of the work that he's doing. He's not ashamed of the study, he's, he's, what he's studying. He's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So there comes, there's a way to rightly divide the word of truth, and that means it takes study, prayer, to rightly divide the word of truth. Otherwise, if you're not, you can say, I'm saved all day long, but if you're not studying the word, then I guarantee you, you're going to wrongly divide the word of truth. But we're living in a world that has gone crazy. And even in some churches, some churches have gone crazy. And I mean crazy, not in the sense of mental illness. I'm saying crazy in the sense of they have, they're in total rebellion to God. We know that. We understand that. You know that because you hear me say it and you hear the preaching of the Word of God. It sticks to you, and you can see the difference between what God says and what the world is doing. And you say, whoa, that's crazy over there. If God is tr God's Word is true, then this is crazy over here. You see it because of the teaching that you have received over the years, the teaching that you've received concerning what God is saying about a subject matter or about this or about that, and you say, man, have these people lost their minds? Let's take, the, let's take a, a, for instance, let's take the, the raging issue today is abortion. Raging issue. Some states have gone to do what they call uh, uh, heartbeat bills. Anybody hear about that? where if the, if the heartbeat of the, of the fetus or the baby can be detected, then the mother cannot have an abortion. Now, first off, let's understand and look at what an abortion is. An abortion is taking the life of somebody else. If I go out and take somebody else's life on the street. Downtown, they will charge me with first degree murder or some level of murder. And if there's enough witnesses and proof, DNA and all that business, then I'll go to prison. Because in our culture, in our society, as in probably every culture and society throughout the world, murder's wrong. And it's wrong because God said in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit murder. Because that's what the Hebrew word actually says. Thou shalt not commit murder. Am I right? We all agree? But now today we have and been having for quite a while people who say it's a woman's body. So she has a right to do with her body what she chooses. And so that's the argument. She has a right to, and, and I would agree if that was her body. I would wholeheartedly agree if that was her body. Except the Bible says, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, and all they that dwell therein. Now, that's just one verse. There's multiple verses that connect with that, but that's just one I can throw out there. So the earth is the Lord's, the fullness of So the earth belongs to God. Well, that deals, look, first off, that deals with the environmentalist issue because the earth is the Lord's. So we can't fix what belongs to somebody else unless they bring it to us to fix it. Now, I don't find where God said, okay, y'all got to fix this. Carp, too much carbon in the air, y'all got to fix this. The earth is the Lord's. What's going to happen to the earth is going to be up to God. 
We cannot create it, and we cannot destroy it. The fullness thereof, that means everything on it. All the plants, all the animals, everything, all the seed-bearing uh, herbs, this, that, the other. The, and all they, every single individual, that dwells therein. So now, that means that my body does not belong to me. Your body doesn't belong to you. So the very foundation of the abortion issue is wrong. Because the foundation of the abortion issue is, it's, a, it's woman's health. I don't quite understand how that's health, but it's women's health, and her body belongs to her. Therefore, what she does with her body is her business. Well, that, found, that foundational statement is in error because it's not her body, it's the Lord's body. But let me take another step further. The Bible also says when it comes to marriage, husband and wife, it says in a, betwe between a husband and wife, it says that her body is not her own and his body is not his own. So when it comes to husband and wife, when it comes to the time of, of coming together uh, to know each other, you know, the, that's the biblical term for having a sexual encounter, you know, coming to know each other, that she... Her body is not her own. His body is not his own. So she can't say, she can't say, get away from me, you brute. He can't say, oh, honey, I've got this headache tonight. I just, you know. That you must be able to understand that you belong to each other. Because what happens when, what happens when, they come, when, what happens when you get married? Anybody knows? You become one flesh. Isn't that what the Bible says? The Bible says that a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife. It says it three times, and each time the Lord is saying it. A man, shall mother, uh, uh, um, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's why when a man hits upon a woman, he's stupid. Because what he's really doing is hurting himself. He's hurting his other half physically, but it's also he's hurting and destroying himself spiritually because the two are one flesh. Y'all hear what I'm saying? So there comes that point where, where so when they come, to, they come together in a mutual agreement, understanding that I don't belong to me and my wife doesn't belong to her, but we belong to each other. So as a man, if my wife says, oh, honey, I'm a little tired today, I can respect that. And I can say, oh, honey, no problem. I understand that because guess what? I'm not, I don't want to harm myself. And vice versa. Y'all get what I'm saying? Y'all hear what I'm saying? So we, you know, we don't believe. Our bodies are not our own. God said it, and the marriage vows just shows it. We, are, we, don't belong to each, we don't belong to ourselves. And ultimately, as a husband and wife, we may be one flesh, but that one flesh belongs to God. Because it's still his. Because guess what? He made us. And anything you make belongs to you. I'll say that again. Anything you make belongs to you. If I go in my garage and I build a car, that's my car. Unless I decide to sell it or give it away. But otherwise, it's my car. I, whatever I make is mine. We didn't make us. Even when a baby is, is conceived, you didn't make it. Oh, let's make a baby. No, you didn't make it. Oh, come on now. But see, that's what teaching does. It begins to show you and reveal to you what is the, the fallacy of the world's argument, the fallacy of what the world is saying. Otherwise, if you don't have proper teaching, what's going to happen? You're going to believe what the world has to say. Well, a woman should be able to do with her body as she chooses. But then the world goes a step further. They say that a minor child, even though a minor has to have permission for any surgery from their parents, when it comes to abortion, they say a minor child doesn't have to have permission. So your 14, 15-year-old daughter can go down to Planned Parenthood and have an abortion, and, you, and, and they are not obligated by law to contact you or let you know. Something's wrong with that picture, isn't it? 
the world has gone crazy. Wait a minute, but it goes even further. Because now in a couple of states, I think New York is one, uh, uh, Virginia or West Virginia is the other, now they have it so you can get an abortion up to the point of delivery. Now, you know, I could almost, I'm not saying I agree this, with this, but I can almost see in the first month or two where, you, and we're not sure what's going on, but by the time you get to three, four, five, six months, come on, seven months, eight months, that's a baby. But it's a baby at conception. You're right. I'm not, I'm not saying, that's what I said, I'm not saying I agree. But I, I can see kind of, if you're in the world, you could think a little crazy like that, a little fuzzy like that. But let me tell you something. It's a baby at conception because it's life at conception. It's life that's separated, separate from the woman and it's life that's separate from the man. It's a life all its own. Ladies, I, I don't want to sound crass but, or, or, or belittling, but you are the incubator for the life that is being produced and brought forth into the world. It's God's creation. You're not, it's not your body. It's God's body. And what he has deemed from the time of Eve all the way through is that women will be the bearer of children. But he never said that those children that the woman, women bear are part of her body. They are separate human beings. And when we forget that, listen very carefully, when we blur those lines and when we begin to say it's not life until it comes out of the birth canal, then all of a sudden it becomes easy to snuff out that life after it's born. It's called infanticide. And guess what? It then becomes easy to snuff out that life when it becomes old and useless. It becomes easy to snuff out that life when it has no social redeeming value. It becomes easy to snuff out that life when it doesn't have the, and I love when they use this term, quality of life. Who is to determine what somebody's quality of life is and should be? How can you, how can I sit there and say, oh, this person who's laid, laid up in bed and bedridden has no quality of life? You know, if that were the case, then I guess Stephen Hawking had no quality of life. And yet he was one of the greatest physicists in, in, our, in our generation. He had a ALS and was confined to a wheelchair. The vast majority of his life could not speak, couldn't move, nothing. And yet in his mind, in his mind, he conceived not only of black holes, but the purpose of black holes, how they function, and through experimentation, they found he was right. A concept that at the very beginning, Albert Einstein start, came up with, and Stephen Hawking carried it from there. But what was his, but if, to look at him, you say, he can't have any quality of life. And so that's a, that's, that, that's, that's a, a, a fallacy, a falsehood, quality of life. And I say to any woman, if she's had one, then guess what? God forgives. God forgives. And, it's not, and so we're not bashing somebody who's had one. We're just trying to say we can't buy the argument of the world that this is, this, you know, and, and it's, it's, this is raging right now. But without proper teaching, churches, Christian folks fall into that category of believing what the world has to say because they always frame their argument in such a way that makes you think, well, that makes sense, but you got to know what the Word of God has to say. That's why a teacher is so important because what a teacher is going to do is reveal to you what is thus saith the Lord, what God is saying. They're bringing revelation to us, to the church, of the mind and heart of God on a subject matter, on a verse, whatever the case may be. And as they bring that revelation, as a teacher reveals that, what does it do? It, 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 it increases those saints so that they have a closer walk with the Lord. There are churches that all they do is preach salvation every Sunday. And the people are, are dying on the vine because they're not being taught what God is saying. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Amen. I'm glad y'all. Is this helping you? Now, it's obvious every single one of us, in a sense, is a teacher. And what I mean by that is not necessarily in the office of teacher, but we are responsible to take the knowledge we have and give it to somebody else. 
one evangelist was speaking about a girl who got uh, saved, uh, I believe it was R.W. Schombach, a uh, girl who got saved in his camp meeting. And uh, she didn't know anything. She had never been to church, didn't know anything about God, but she came to this camp meeting. Man got saved, and she only knew one, we, she only knew one verse because it was the verse that he used, and she only knew that verse, and it was uh, uh, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have every, everlasting life. That's all she knew. And so she was so excited about her newfound salvation. She was so excited. She stood out on the street corner and began to shout to people, For God so loved the world, it's a true story, that he gave his only begotten son, who has ever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You need to get saved. You need to get saved because God so loved the world. And that's all she, because that's the only verse she knew. She didn't know anything else. But what she knew, what she knew, she began to declare. She began to declare to those around her. And there was a guy, and she did this like every day. And there was a guy walking past her every day. He walked past, he heard her, heard her, and finally he stopped and he said, listen. He said, now, nah, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in all this stuff. He said, but, but you are so, you're, you're just so adamant about this. He said, how do you know it's true? And she said, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. She said, I don't know anything else, but I do know that because he died for me and saved me. That guy ended up getting saved. That guy ended up getting saved because, but see, so she told what she knew. How often are we just telling what we know? Most of the time, we're not even speaking about what we know. We'll be at work or here or there, whatever the case may be, and somebody strikes up a conversation. Are you telling them what you know? Are you telling them about the Word of God and, 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 the, and, and what God has revealed to you through the teaching of the Word? That's what we ought to be doing. Amen? There's a scripture over in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 9. It talks about Apollos and, and, and um, uh, uh, Paul. And because and, uh, there was an argument in the church about, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Paul. Some said, I belong to Jesus. And Paul had to write, that, write to the Corinthians and say, no, 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 let's, let's put a halt to this. He said, Let, let's put a halt to this. I'm nobody. Apollos is nobody. It's all about Jesus. And, he, and then he goes on to say, he says, look, I plant it, but Apollos watered, but it's God who gets the increase. God gets the increase. It's not about him who plants or him who waters. It's about God receiving or reaping the benefits from the crop that's planted. Because he's the, he's the husbandman. He's the one who owns it all. So he reaps. Hey, Y'all hear what I'm saying? If God truly is, uh, uh, the, the, the earth is the Lord's and fullness thereof, if the earth truly is the Lord's, then God, guess what? He reaps everything that comes from this earth. All, all, everything. It belongs to him. It all belongs to him. So we have to understand that. So who was Apollos? Was Apollos some evangelist? No, he was a teacher. Because he came along after Paul would plant, he would go, go along and he would minister in these various churches that Paul had planted, teaching them the things of God, teaching them the revelation of God and what God was saying and what God was doing. And, and there's another scripture about Paulus too, how he helped them greatly. But the point is, here's, here's, here's this idea of Paul planting and Apollos watering. Listen, a good gardener, a good gardener understands one thing. You cannot till up the ground, plant some seed and then leave it and expect to come back in the fall and get a harvest. You have to take care of the ground. That means you have to water it. You have to do a little fertilization. You have to pull out the weeds. That's what a good teacher does. He waters. He pulls out the weeds. He fertilizes it a little bit so that what? The crop can be done. You might have somebody who comes along and plant, but the, the gardener is going to water that thing, and the pastor, the teacher rather, is going to water, and the pastor too, is going to water that thing, and he's going to make it so that by the time it's all over, there's a good crop to be harvested. For who? For the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? I'm going to take a few minutes because I've got a, a passage of Scripture that is a little difficult, but I think you, you will come to enjoy it. It's found over in John chapter 6, and it says this. Jesus was speaking. He says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Now, he's talking about two different things, obviously. He says, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Now, this is Jesus teaching them something. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. 
He says, the bread I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They didn't get it. They missed it. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Now, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? But eat the flesh of the Son of Man. Now, I'm going to stop right there because in Catholicism, one of the things they do is they take the communion, which is the wafer representing the, the, the flesh and the cup representing the blood, and uh, they, have what they, they, they say that when you take it, it becomes, it changes to the flesh and blood of Jesus as you consume it. And it's based on with this verse, is what that whole doctrine is based on this verse. But that's not what Jesus was talking about. That's not what you, we take communion and we know it represents the flesh and the, and, the, and the cup represents the blood of Jesus, but it doesn't become the flesh and the blood of Jesus as we eat it, okay? Uh, but that's, that's in Catholicism, that's, that's hope, and that's why uh, communion is such a huge deal for them uh, because you're then consuming, in, in their doctrine, consuming the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But actually, it, it reads different than that. All right, so he says, uh, uh, then the Jews begin to argue, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will, have no li uh, I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, and all he who also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven. Now, on the surface, it sounds like cannibalism. All right, on the surface. And that's what the, that's what the Jewish leaders had a problem with. And uh, therefore, when he, many of his disciples, when they heard this, now many of his disciples, when they, heard this, when they heard this statement, they said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Now he's giving some explanation, but they're still not getting it. He says, this, with the, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are this, uh, our spirit and our life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he was saying, for this reason I have said to you that no one, listen, no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples, not the 12, not even the 70, but many other disciples who followed him, many disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. That means they permanently withdrew and never followed him again. So Jesus said to the 12, you do not want to go away also? He says, you, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. Now, I don't think Peter understood it and saw it, but Peter said, I have enough faith in you to know that you have the words of eternal life, and I may not understand this hard saying, but I trust that what you're saying makes, you know, is something that is beneficial to us. I know you're not calling us to be cannibals, and I don't quite understand about the eating of the flesh and the drinking of the blood, but you have the words to eternal life. There's no place else for us to go. We're, we're right here. We're right here. I, see, I use that because so many times, so many people run into a roadblock when it comes to, to, to their Christianity. They run into a roadblock. I was reading the other day about some guy who was a, you know, played in the church band. He was saved, loved God, married him and his wife, and this, that, the other. Then, I mean, just, just totally committed to God. Evangelical, blah, blah, this, that, the other. And then, and then his wife left him for another man. His whole world came crashing down, and he was wondering, why didn't God fix that? Well, first off, God never said you weren't going to go through trials and tribulations. So I think it's a fallacy to, you know, it's, it's crazy to say, God, you, you, you shouldn't let this happen to me. Guess what? Good things happen to bad people all the time. I mean, bad things happen to good people all the time. <laughs> all the time. But is that going to cause me to lose my faith in God? Like, 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 uh, like, like uh, uh, Job said, should only good come to me? Should only good come to me from the Lord? When the bad comes, I got to stick with God. 
But this guy, he, so he walks away, and he, he, say, he became an atheist for a minute. Now he's spiritual. Not reading the Bible, not studying Christ, but just kind of spiritual. You know, I know that, you know, all this kind of craziness. Well, how shallow was his relationship with Jesus Christ? That when a problem came, what he considered a big problem came, he folded and crumbled. And that happens all the time, saints. People fold and crumble. This is what happened here. Jesus is speaking in the synagogue. Man, the Pharisees and stuff, they're just flipping out, man. What? what? He didn't oh, this, oh, this, oh. But even those who were his disciples, those who believed, those who have been following him, many who have been following him, looked and said, what? Oh, man. This is a hard, this is too hard. And the Bible says they didn't follow him anymore. They walked away. Now, Jesus wasn't talking about literally taking a you know, bite out of his arm or cutting him and putting a cup up to it and then drinking his blood. No. What he was talking, what he very simply was talking about is we have to take upon ourselves Christ. We do have to consume Christ and since spiritually take him into ourselves totally and completely. Because guess what the objective is for the kingdom for the kingdom saying? To be like Christ. And so Jesus is saying, to be like me, you eat my flesh and drink my blood. He wasn't saying, eat my arm and, and, and you know, blood let me. What he was saying is, you have to take me spiritually, totally consume all of me, consume all of me as you live this life so that you can grow in stature to the fullness of Christ. They didn't get it. But here's one thing I love about this passage. Jesus didn't explain it either. Now, you know why? You know why? Because <laughs> most of the time we talk about this, and we, but we never talk about why he didn't explain it. And he gave a little, little bit of an explanation, but not enough for people to say, oh, I get it now. Because, see, it was their job to become responsible by faith and receive what he had to say. See, there's going to be times you don't understand something. There's going to be a point where you don't grab hold to it. You don't get it. You're like, I still don't get it. And I can't be real because I don't get it. No, no, no. You have to believe it by faith. See, you came to Christ by faith. You didn't see Jesus on that cross. You didn't see the spear thrust in his side. You didn't see the 39 stripes on his back. You didn't see the crown of thorns. You didn't see every ounce of his blood draining from his body. You didn't see any of that. You read about it in a book. But you believed it by faith. An event that happened 2,000 years ago, you believed by faith. And not only just say, oh, that, I believe that happened. But you say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, died for the sins of the world. Therefore, I'm submitting myself to him, somebody who lived 2,000 years ago and died on the cross. So if I can accept that by faith, can I not accept everything else he says by faith? I don't have to understand it. I don't have to have, I don't, look, I don't have, to have a Ph.D. degree in theology to grab hold and say, oh, now I get it. Now I believe it. No, no, no. Let, let, let me tell you how, this, how, how, how salvation works and how, how uh, Christianity works. It works as you first believe, then you receive. You believe first. God is not looking for those who understand it. He's looking for believers. Not understanders. Oh, I get it now. Well, it, it may be too late by that time. Rapture may have come and gone and you left behind. <laughs> no, he's looking for those who believe, who say, Lord, I don't get it. I don't understand it, but I believe you because you are the eternal father. You're the ancient of days. Your El Shaddai. You, you are the one and only. There's nobody aside from you. So I believe you. I don't get it because I'm a finite human being with a finite mind, but your word is eternal and it is truth. I believe it. I stand on it. Listen, I don't know how miracles work. I don't know how healings work. I don't know how any of that stuff work, but I believe believe it because God said it and guess what I've seen it happen because I believe because I believe do you believe then we can't sit around talking about well I just don't get it now until I get it I'm just not gonna do it now that's that's foolishness that's foolishness you don't get it 
That's all right. You, you can already say it. God said it. I believe it. There it is there. There's a, there's a whole saying to that. I forgot what it is now. But, but you know, I, be, I believe what he says. And what the teacher's job is to do is to teach you these things, to share with you these things. So can, you can take that passage of Scripture, and, and it takes a whole message to really break all that down. But in a few minutes, I broke it down to you so you could understand, oh, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about consuming him totally and completely, not just a Sunday Jesus, but a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday Jesus too. Now, many went away from him. And I love this because he didn't even bother to explain. Hey, hey, come back. Hold on. Let me explain to you what I'm talking about. He didn't bother to do that. We always trying to explain. We always trying to explain. Oh, I, they, no, no. It really, we trying to explain. Listen, you know, we get what the word of God says. If God gives us a revelation on it, we tell it. If we don't, he doesn't. And guess what? We got to just accept it by faith. And those who say, well, you know, pastor, I've been going to this church for five years. And I heard you preach and teach and this, that, the other, and half the stuff. I, I, I just don't see it. I don't see it. I got to go someplace else. Then goodbye. I, I'm, I'm serious. We're trying to, oh, no, no, no. See, you know, I didn't really mean this. I meant that. Listen, if they're not spiritually astute, and I'm not saying, I know we have baby Christians. You know, we got all level of saints in the church. From the newborn to those who are ancient. <laughs> we got all kind of levels. But the teaching ministry should be one that addresses each one in even one message that everybody can get it. And for the person who says, oh, I've been saved 50 years. Yeah, I know that. Listen, you listen to that message and you'll find there's something in there that you didn't know. Because one, if I don't know anything else, I know this. The more I think I know, the more I don't know. The more I learn, the more ignorant I understand that I am. Not because I'm stupid. Nobody's stupid. No, it's because we realize that as we plumb the depths of the mind of God, there's so much that we don't know. There's so much to learn. Man, I know when I first got saved, I knew it all. I thought, oh, this is, man, I got this. I got this. Then as I started studying, I was like, whoa, I'm out of my element. God is so deep. His Holy Ghost is so deep. Man, I'm telling you. And I'm still finding things out all these years later. And guess what? Until the day I die, I'll be finding things out. When I cross over and go to heaven, I'll be finding things out. Guess what? There are things I won't even know throughout all eternity about God. How do I know that? The Bible tells me. Because it says this, that there are angels around the throne of God. And what do they, what, they, some of y'all know this, what do they shout? What's the word, what's this phrase they shout? Holy, holy. Why are they shouting that? They're down there for eternity shouting, holy, holy, holy. It's the Lord God of my, holy, holy. Why, why are they shouting that? Because every time they take a look at God, they see something they never saw before. He is so vast. His spirit is so amazing and so awesome that no matter how many times you look at him, you see something. You, don't, you never become familiar. See, I know my wife. I know it, just about everything about her. At least I think I do. And, and I know, you know, I know her face. I can close my eyes and see her face. But let me tell you something. There's going to be things about God we will never know throughout all eternity. Why? Because he is God Almighty. And we can never know everything about him. So we accept it. How? By faith. We believe. Let's stand on our feet, please. <clears throat> that teacher is going to build you.